Okay, our next speaker is Devashis Bhattachara, and he'll be talking about uh, greening the tree of life. Thank you, Mike. Uh, happy to be here. That was the uh, pretty uh, title, Greening the Tree of Life. Well, how do you do that? Well, you use genomes to understand the origin and evolution of algae, their plastids, and, and their place in the tree of life. That's a much more long and devious title. I'm not going to talk about plants, which is the way that most people think about greening the tree of life. I'm going to talk about algae. And uh, algae are some of these microbial eukaryotes, small cells that are shown on the bottom of the slide, things that have huge impacts on climate. Um, air we breathe, providing about half of the air that humans breathe, and uh, uh, big biological consequences wherever they're found. I came here from the University of Iowa, and um, four postdocs came with me, as well as web designers. And so this is the lab I have now at Rutgers. I'm very thankful to these people for the work they've done, but also they provided us a chance to get going here um, rapidly and to have some success already. So, okay. From whence to Bashish? Well, he was born in India, left. I always say I got on the grain, bro grain boat by myself, but in fact, I came with my family, age nine. Canadian, educated at Dalhousie University, got a PhD on the other coast. I was a marine ecologist at that time, uh, Simon Fraser. I uh, was a Sloan Fellow with a fellow named Mitch Sogan, who's an evolutionary biologist at MBL. Headed off to Germany, where I lived for seven years. Worked at the Max Planck Institute and was a, I was a Humboldt fellow there. Learned about protein biochemistry and um, a lot of really important things that have impacted my work. Uh, became a professor in Iowa, and here I am in Rutgers starting July 1st. So a lot of stuff goes on in my lab. Um, I broke it down into three areas. I guess the most important one is how to photosynthetic and mitochondrial endosymbionts the parts of a eukaryotic cell that make it eukaryotic, that allow it to fix carbon to be an algae or a plant, allow it to generate energy. Where do these organelles come from? And really, the whole point here is to understand some of the key elements that make eukaryotes, like humans and, and fungi and plants, what they are. A very different, but also very fascinating uh, arm of research in my lab is understanding red tides. Working with uh, collaborators at Woods Hole, uh, down in Texas, uh, also in California, we're developing genetic tools to understand um, the algae that cause red tides, the genes they have that al allow them to make toxin, for, the, for example, the ones that shut down shellfish fisheries and so on. Finally, we're part of a number of people in the world who are trying to fulfill Darwin's dream of having a relatively accurate genealogy of uh, species in our planet. That's called the tree of life. That seems like a straightforward thing, but it turns out the more we learn about eukaryotes, algae, plants, and other, and other organisms, the more complex it turns out to be. And I'll just talk briefly about that in a bit. So I say the work in our lab is microbial genomics, but it's done from the inside. People who study the interaction between uh, prokaryotes, that is bacteria, and other bacteria, or, or algae and bacteria, they're talking about the external environment. We actually look at an ancient uh, capture that occurred when a cyanobacterium was brought into a eukaryotic cell, became the plastid or the chloroplast that fixes uh, uh, carbon dioxide, uses light energy, and has become one of the most important um, markers of life in our planet. So it's microbial, eukary uh, microbial genomics told from the inside. And that inside part of it is, again, not so straightforward. The, the process that brought that foreign cell into algae and plants is called endosymbiosis. In the ancient event, one and a half billion years ago, a free-living cyanobacterium, a photosynthetic bacterium, was captured, and it was turned into an organelle. That's called primary endosymbiosis. It turns out that other algae were themselves then engulfed through secondary endosymbiosis, and believe it or not, this happened yet again for tertiary endosymbiosis. You don't have to understand the structure of DNA to understand that when you have multiple genomes resident in one cell, you have the processes of DNA moving between these uh, sources of DNA. You can have a very complex and convoluted history for eukaryotes. And that's exactly uh, what we study, is how did all of these chimeric genomes interact, and what was lost, and what was maintained. So the way we do it nowadays is not through observation or electron microscopy. We do that, but we do something called next generation sequencing, which is a sort of a revolution, kind of like uh, the the molecular biologist um, moon program. It's 
enabled incredible amounts of uh, research to happen and to ask fundamentally difficult questions about eukaryotes and their genomes that we couldn't do just 10 years ago. And here are a number of interesting critters that are in my lab from whom we're determining the complete genome sequences, annotating, that is, making some predictions about what those genes do, where they came from, and how they impact on the evolution of that lineage over time. It includes, for example, the uh, red tide forming dinoflagellate called Alexandrium. It includes the most ancient photosynthetic lineage on our planet called Cyanophora. Heck, it even includes the sushi wrap called Porphyra. That's nori. That's that red fan in the middle on the bottom right. That's one of the most important fishes in the world, and we're in a project with the Joint Genome Institute and our collaborators to determine the, uh, the sequence of the nori and to find out how it became what it is. I just want to, uh, instead of talking in detail, I'll just spend a minute on, I think, what I hope you recognize as a really oddball organism up there. It's the one in the top right-hand corner. It's actually an animal. It's called Alesia chlorotica. It's an amazing animal that becomes a plant. So here's, um, on the lower right, you see those red circles. That's actually uh, autofluorescence of chloroplasts inside the gut once they've been extricated from Alesia. This animal is a normal mollusk. It feeds on algae, keeps their chloroplasts or machines of photosynthesis, keeps them, maintains them in their gut, shown on the top, um, your top right. That's the heart on the very top right. And that's the gut, which is networking. And all that green are all the captured chloroplasts from the alga. This animal stops being an animal and can be maintained in culture at a photosynthetic organism for 12 months to complete its life cycle. How does it do that? How do you make an animal into a plant? So we have, a, uh, we have some funding to sequence the genome of Elysia, the alga that it eats, and to look at the function of genes and their expression for both of these uh, systems to figure out how you make an animal into a plant. This is work done with Mary Rumpho at the University of Maine. Let's get back to red tides. Red tides can be noxious, like in the um, uh, top right, or not so noxious, like in the bottom left. That's Noctiluca off the coast of California. Lots of algae uh, growing vegetatively, making a large bloom in the ocean. If those algae are producing a poison, that's a lot of poison that's concentrated that can have a big impact on marine life. Animals that eat it, um, and us who eat animals who eat it, that can cause poisoning for humans. So is that an easy question? Well, here's a straightforward comparison. We all know Charles Darwin, visionary. His genome was about 3 billion base pairs. As a young man, he was an omnivore, became a vegetarian later on. Here is the dinoflagellate that makes red tides, Alexandrium. Its genome is about 70 times larger. It's 50 micrometers in size. It has a huge genome and makes it pretty difficult to understand how dinoflagellates do what they do. Incredibly complex organisms packaged in microcells. So what do you do when you have a genome that's too large to sequence, to interpret rapidly? You do something called transcriptomics. We simply make a catalog of the genes as they're expressed as mRNA. And when you do a lot of that, it's called deep transcriptomics. And that's what we've done in my lab um, to figure out how many genes in dinoflagellates, when they're expressed, which ones may play a role in making saxitoxin, this poison that they produce. And we've uh, done that using next generation sequencing. The one shown on the far our right is called a pyro sequencing from a company called Life Sciences, now owned by Roche. And we study the expression of genes under, under different culture conditions, make catalog, catalogs of which genes are turned on when, try to figure out how the dinoflagellate is sensing its environment and which genes it's using under those different environmental conditions. A lot of stuff goes on here. I'll just give you one interesting point that comes out. If you were to tally up the number of genes in humans with their genome size and in Alexandrium, Alexander would have about like 2 million genes. Well, that's unlikely to happen. If you end up then tallying up all the unique genes we find in Alexandrium based on transcriptomics, we come up to a rather large number, though, 40,000 unique genes in Alexandrium. That's the most gene-rich of all unicellular eukaryotes. So this very important organism has an immense genome, very complex lifestyle, life history, as well as a lot of genes. And so this is a method called MPSS, where we uh, tally express genes. And what comes out of all that, dinoflagellates like Alexandrium have the largest number of genes known for a unicellular organism. And that huge amount of DNA they have doesn't, isn't full of 2 million genes, 40,000 genes. And it turns out that much of the DNA they have is for packaging the chromosomes. That's another story I won't get into, but it's really 
interesting, another peculiar feature of these amazing organisms. So what can I do at Rutgers? A lot. That's why I was very happy to come here. I'm involved in two projects that have, for which we've already submitted grants uh, with uh, Paul Falkowski at the Institute for Marine Coastal Sciences and Chuck Dismukes, who's here. At the Waxman and others, we have an, uh, a grant to bring money to Rutgers to do algal biofuel research. I'm also involved with Paul, um, Oscar Schofield, and, and others, including Lena Struva is also here at Ecology and Evolution uh, to understand how biological entities in the ocean had an impact on global climate. That's an interesting connection between the physical and the biological world, something that Paul Falkowski has thought about for a long time. I've also started um, a collaboration with Kay Beidel, a professor at IMCS and uh, Asaf Baidi, to understand how these large dinoflagellate blooms that occur in the ocean, how they're brought down. What brings about the demise of red tides? It turns out one of the dinoflagellates is called heterosigma. It's brought down by a virus. And a Japanese collaborator has just, uh, Keizo Nagasaki, has brought us the alga, alga and the virus at which K is growing. We're going to do genomics of the dinoflagellate and the virus and figure out how the virus impacts gene expression and is able to literally kill a red tide. Stop with that. I'll be happy to take any questions. Yeah, sir. Are there more examples of uh, animals turned into plants? Or There's one that's been um, thought about. Uh, I've, I've heard from an Australian investigator in, in, the, in the Great Barrier Reef that there's another mollusk that does this. Elysia chlorotica is one of many species that do that. Many of them eat it and they digest it and it's gone. Elysia is unique in gathering these, uh, the algae is called Valcheria, gathering the Valcheria plastids, maintaining the plastids without the nuclei in its gut for the completion, completion of its life cycle for up to 12 months. That's what makes Valcheria, or makes, sorry, Elysia very unique, the, the ability to, to maintain plastids and their function over long periods of time. That makes it sort of kind of a unique system uh, that we know of. Chuck? Is the uh, chloroplast genome uh, altered uh, once it's displaced by the uh, organism? So when we uh, did that first analysis, we determined the sequence of the chloroplast genome inside, uh, isolated from the sea slug, as well as the sea slug mitochondrial genome, trying to find targets for gene transfer that may play a role. The chloroplast genome is absolutely normal and nearly identical to that isolated from the free-living Valcheria. And the mitochondrial genome, which is standard 16 KB animal genome, the, the, the nuclear genome project is going to hopefully turn up. All those keys that help to run the plastid, but, but are not found in the organelle DNA, they're most likely found in the nucleus. And that's uh, what the, the premise under which we're going. Okay, thank you very much.